education by the school, where we are, where we're going, and where we came from. But before I start a summary overview and a direction about a school, I want to give you some big picture about UT Health. So the health care has been changing, especially over the past five, ten years. And the change is going to have a big impact on uh, all the academic medical centers, including UT Health. And we are part of UT Health, and we are affected. So I just want to give you some ideas about uh, the direction, and uh, then talk about uh, where we should go and uh, what we should do to actually ride on the wave. So this is a, a chart about the support for academic medical centers. The one on the left is the data about 55 years ago. If you look at the funding, the percentage of funding from each category, uh, the federal research accounted for about 31% of the funding, and the clinical service is only 6%, okay? So if you look at the numbers again, about five years ago, this one is, is changing even more, so more clinic income, you can see that half of the revenue or income or spending are the clinical. So what does this mean for us? Even if we do not take care of patients directly, at least majority of us, so this is going to affect the entire education, research, and service mission for our school. If you look at the data for UT Health, so we are exactly the, the picture as you saw on the previous slide. At UT Health, the clinical income accounts for 53% of UT Health revenue. And if you look at the tuition and fees, 3%. It's a very small, tiny amount. And the state funding, including uh, some special items, some other items, about 17% uh, for UT Health. And the contract and grants is only about 15%. And this number may go down, down the road because federal funding has been increasing over the past almost five to 10 years. So the situation is clear here. Basically more and more clinical income, more practice. So this means that our school should be aligned to support a clinical practice. So we can get a share of a clinical income. So it's pretty simple. Uh, here is a picture of UT uh, Health medical school practice. As you can see that the, the revenue for clinic income, it was about 400 uh, million about uh, 80 years ago. And actually this year, the latest number is about 1.4 billion. So it's huge, more than doubled, which means that that's where we can get our money. And actually for our school, because research and education never rarely take a profit. So we have to rely on the support from the present office. And the funding is typically from the clinic income from the medical practice. So that means we should get our education, research, and application service aligned to the clinic practice. Uh, if you look at the market share for inpatient care in Houston, uh, our clinic partner, the primary one, Member Herman System, they actually has about 25% of market share in Houston, biggest one ever, the uh, biggest one in Houston. The second largest one is the commercial HCA uh, network, then Methodist, Harris Health, CHR St. Luke's, and uh, some other uh, uh, hospitals over there. As you can see that UT Health, we have very good, good standing here because our clinic partner covers I mean, a huge population of Houston. When we do research or clinical quality improvement, we have the population we need. We can do almost pretty much everything. So now let's back to our school. And I just want to repeat uh, missions of our school. And the number one mission is education. And we are educating and training the future scientists as well as professionals who actually work in the real world to solve real problems. 
We also do research to improve healthcare as well as making biomedical discoveries. And the last one is getting more and more important, which means that we will do more uh, activities, service, whatever, in a clinical setting to work with the clinical partners like our UT physicians, Mama Herman system, Harris Health, and other hospitals here. So that's where the major actions are, and we should do more in that direction. <coughs> okay, so today I'm making my presentation short, so I will have my top 10 list summarize what has happened over the past year. Okay, are you ready for that? <laughs> okay, the first one is that, as you can see, uh, so the academic affairs team has done a great job, and also the faculty. As you can see that our enrollment has more than doubled over the past two years. Okay, we as for this semester, the students who are enrolled in our school for a degree or certificate, we have 252 for this fall semester. And we have more than 140 applicants for the spring semester, which will start in one month. We already admitted 60 plus 30, 91. Student for the fall, for the spring semester. If we graduate like 20 or 30, we can add 60 more students. So we are reaching the critical point of 300 students uh, in the spring, maybe summer. It's coming soon. As you can see, that this area is exploding. It's growing very fast. Okay, so you're lucky in the right field. Okay, so the second one is that we have some success. Uh, in our expansion to the rest of Texas, especially initially the UT system <coughs> campuses. Um, so up to now, we have had 28 students in the Rio Grande Valley area, either through the four plus one program or through our certificate in the master program. <coughs> so we, so this is more than 10% of our students now, as of today. So it's a major, major uh, achievement over there. And we are expanding to El Paso. Uh, 2016, we already have one agreement signed with the School of Business. So we are going to offer certificate in informatics for their business school students. And we are also working on a few additional agreements with other programs over there. So hopefully we can get more students in that area. And we are also expanding to San Antonio. So we have even one faculty member, Angela Ross. She is physically located in San Antonio. So hopefully we can tap into that big market. So they do not have any informatics program there, but they have a lot of healthcare workers, and they did train in informatics. So that's a major potential market for us. Okay, number eight. We had a, a tremendous growth in faculty size. So since September 1st last year, we have hired seven new faculty members. Deborah Simmons right here, she was the Chief Quality Officer at St. Andrews in Dukes. Uh, Kirk Roberts, he's finishing his training at National Library of Medicine. He's going, to join, he's going to join us on April 1st. And he is going to bring uh, what we call kangaroo grant, K training grant plus R research grant together. So he's going to come here with a major grant. So that means our school is pretty attractive to people across the country. And they do want to come here. And Judah Ross, I'm so glad that she is our first African American faculty member. Okay? That's a huge shit for us. <laughs> but we're proud of getting her here. And Tiffany Champagne uh, was a healthcare executive uh, working on HIE. Uh, she has training in public health and uh, you know, in business management. And Zhong Ming Zhao is a new faculty member who is going to join us on January 1st from Vanderbilt. He is going to lead our new Center for Precision Health, uh, which is a joint center between our school and the School of Public Health. And Bob Murphy, he was the Chief Medical Information Officer for the Mama Herman System. So he's, he joined our school full time on September 1st. <coughs> He's going to bring a lot of experience from the clinical operations. And we have Dr. Hu Ling Wu right here. He is only 20% time at SBMI, but I think he spent 80% of his time here. 
Uh, he is primary appointment is at the Biostat Department, that's for public health. And uh, he is working on big data at Biostat. So he's new here. If you want to work with him as on projects, please contact him directly. And we are recruiting four more faculty members at this moment for the Center of Precision Health. Hopefully by spring, we're going to have four more faculty members at least to join us. Okay, that's a major uh, item here. Number seven, as I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, so we are establishing a joint center between the School of Public Health and SBMI for Precision Health. And uh, we are getting more faculty members. And this is going to be only bigger because Precision Health, Precision Medicine is a national program that just got started earlier this year by President Obama. The initial funding was $250 million for this 2016 fiscal year to start a 1 million volunteer cohort program to get data from 1 million Americans who will volunteer their genetic data, clinical behavior, all the kind of data to a centralized database for research and discovery. So this is just the beginning, 215, that's small. What I heard is that NIH is requesting is in care of the $2.3 billion for precision medicine over the years to come. So it's going to be a huge, huge funding opportunity for all of us because we are right in this field. Okay, number six, we have done quite a lot in our uh, development fundraising effort. So at this time, we, uh, we just got a uh, four more new professorships over the past year. Uh, on top of the two we already have, so we have quite a lot. So endowed professors <coughs> are very important um, vehicles for us to recruit and retain the brightest faculty. And the amount of money you get from this is typically small, but the, the important part is the recognition. Okay, so it's recognition of the treatment of faculty members have, have done. And we are going to continue to do more for this. And my, my, my goal is to, to endorse every full professor here. So if you are not yet, work hard to get promoted. <laughs> Down the road, I might have my goal. I don't know if you can achieve that, but that's my goal there. Okay, number five, uh, informatics is still a brand new field, even if it has been around for 10, 15, even 30 years. So it's still changing and evolving and emerging. Uh, there's no <coughs> standard ranking system that ranks compared to different programs. But we do have some initial indicators for online master program. So there are some national organizations that collect data to compare different online programs. I'm glad to tell you that our program is the third best amongst more than 35 online master programs in health informatics. And also, we are the third most affordable one. So combine these two, quality and affordability, but we're number one, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can't do all the calculation over there. <laughs> so hopefully, one, yeah, when we get more and more of this and get more established, I think uh, our school is so far, I think, is I only can say one of the biggest, uh, maybe the biggest one, depending on how you define it. If you count the real faculty member who are paid by the school, I think we are at the very top. Uh, if, if not number one, or number two, or number three. And a student body, if you count the real informatics student, we are still on the top three, maybe number one. So University of Illinois Chicago has more students, but they have a lot of students in healthcare management. So we don't know how to divide them. But we are all squeezed big because in Texas, the average has to be big. And we are only one in Texas. Okay, number four. You're gonna like this one. <laughs> our school, uh, the research expansion, the research spending of our school uh, over the past 15, 17 years, if you let, look at the growth, okay, it has perfect correlation with Apple computer stock price. <laughs> So I think if our SMI is a company, we can all retire today, <laughs> right? So that's the kind of trend we are looking and we are growing uh, even faster. 
Okay, number three, and uh, it's, we are very lucky and uh, very grateful to <coughs> the funding that we got from the state. So the state legislature allocated $3.5 million per biennium per every two years to support our school, to expand our programs to the rest of Texas, and to enhance our precision medicine program. So this is a big item for us, even if it's the amount is may not be big, but in comparison with the size, or this is a huge amount, and we are using this funding to recruit the center faculty, the faculty for the Center for Precision Health. We also use this to, we already recruited quite a few faculty members here, Deborah, Angela, and Huling, and all the faculty members are partially supported by this funding. So this is a very, very nice gift to our school <coughs> from the state and from your tax money. Okay, number three, and we, we are getting closer, I hope, someday. My, my next big goal is to get a building for our school, a separate standalone building for the school. <coughs> and we have two candidates. There were one, but today we have two. So one of the options, do you all know the TMC library? Yeah. The, the small building at the heart of Texas Medical Center between Baylor and UT Medical School. And UT is going to buy that building. And we have a good chance, I cannot see the likelihood, but we have some chance to <laughs> occupy that building. <laughs> if we do, so that a major part of the building will be our schools. So we can have a school name on the wall of the building. <laughs> so that's one option. Now we have something even more exciting, so I don't know which one to go. Probably can't take a vote, okay, among myself. There is a TMC3 program started by the Texas Medical Center. It's a new development. If you are going to visit this area, it's somewhere on Old Spanish and Cambridge and Fanning, somewhere in that area. Uh, there is going to be a big complex of facilities including academic research as well as residential and hotel or conference for people to stay, okay? This building, the center part, is a double headache on purpose because we're doing biomedical. It's about DNA or whatever. And at the four corners, there will be four anchors. UT Health is one of them. And we have MD Anderson, I think Bader, and the text and M. So we have four anchor and four colors. And the idea is to create a collab collaborative environment over there so people can share ideas, can talk from different places. So this one is going to happen for sure. So I think the initial uh, phase will be completed by 2017. So very, very fast. Okay. Wow. So at this time, we do not know which one was going to go. And, uh, so basically, the top one is more like Manhattan. You go over there, get a smaller space, older building, but uh, you are in actions. If you go to that one, we're back to Texas. <laughs> Big space and very nice, you know, everything's big. Okay? So at this time, we don't know. Uh, I hope one of this will come to us very soon. Okay, and the last one. Have you seen this on the freeway? <laughs> <laughs> I took a quite a few selfies. <laughs> it was uh, 59 on the way to airport, but today it's, it's uh, 59 by New Castle. If you drive from to downtown, so over there. <laughs> but again, this is simply a, a promotion for our school. So what we sh really should have is as being my faculty and students. Okay. So they simply use my face for whatever purpose. It's actually stranger to recognize me now. <laughs> Kind of dangerous, right? That's for your yeah. Okay, so that's my top ten, and uh, I have any questions so far before I go to the next topic. Anything about school? Okay, we can have more questions at the end. So the next thing I want to talk about is to uh, to do a little presentation about the future of informatics. What informatics can do, can bring. Okay, so this is based on some old slides. I modified the contents. It's based on the Sharp program we had uh, that finished 
a couple years ago. And uh, so before we talk about <coughs> the future, we have to go back to the history. So it's very important to, to see the, all the major events, especially economic events in human history. So about uh, 10,000 years ago, there was a major revolution, the agricultural revolution. That transformed everything. It's simple, looks simple, but it's uh, uh, amazing from like uh, hunting, right? If you're hungry, go hunt. When you're not hungry, you don't have any food. When you're hungry, you may not be able to find that animal, so you can die. So it's transformed to something more systematic farming of animals and plants and food. So that's a huge, huge revolution in human history many years ago. The second one is the Industrial Revolution uh, in, the, in the 18th century. And this one, I think you all know, is, uh, the impact is, is huge. <coughs> Just look at here, some examples here, like uh, the, the, the farming by animals to machines, transportation by animals to trains. So the efficiency has been increased dramatically. So the impact is huge. The third one is the internet revolution that occurred <coughs> somewhere in the 1990s. And this revolution has brought a lot of things that we are enjoying today, every single day. Like, I don't think any of you are still writing letters on paper sent to your parents or friends. Anybody still doing that? <laughs> okay, we should have one. One, <laughs> one of 50. <laughs> paper is still rough. Paper is still rough forever, so. That it makes sense. And also communication and uh, storage and uh, I don't know how many of you are still reading paper newspapers. Only one. Okay, good. Two percent. So so information So information is readily available on your phone. So that's the last another big trend over there. So what's gonna happen after this? So there's something called big data revolution. I think it's happening at this moment. Started a few years ago. Basically, big data, huge. Um, even a few years ago, 90% of data were created in the past two years. And today, we process more information than a single uh, than a person processes process for his or her entire life in the 17th century. Okay, it's just amazing over there. So with all the data everywhere, especially in healthcare, so we have big challenges as well as big opportunities for us, for everybody here. So that means job security for the next, I don't know how many years, okay? <laughs> so the, the impact is actually huge. If you look at the, uh, you picked one metaphor here, it's kind of a, a language here to see the demonstrated potential impact. It's more like uh, the, the transition from speech to writing. That was a huge, huge event in human history. So why you can only talk but cannot write? The speech is transient, right? When you talk, it's gone. Nobody can require anything. You cannot do data analysis, no analytics, no informatics, right? So that had a major impact in the evolution of human history and cognition. So the big data revolution basically brings every single thing, whether you want it or, or do not, they are recorded somewhere on computers, which can be used and analyzed. So that's a huge, that's the impact is still to be seen, but it's huge. <coughs> okay, uh, if you draw the a diagram, so this is log scale at the bottom, okay? The, the time it took to move from one revolution to the next is about uh, 10,000 years from the agriculture to the, to the next one. 200 years from industrial to internet, 22 years from internet to big data. If you do this projection, if you are um, a math wizard, or whatever you want to do the projection, the next one is going to come in two years. It's already happening now. So <coughs> big data revolution started about three years ago, so we are in the middle of the next big revolution. So if it is, what will it be? What does it look like? It's not big data. Big data is, is a problem, actually. It's not. Is not something that we really want. We want what we want is small data. That's what we need, and a precise and personalized and advanced knowledge that can tell you more knowledge and information instead of junk data. And the the intelligence provided has to be live in real time, and it has to be transparent. You can see what's going on just by looking. 
don't have to do our calculations, and it has to be able to predict. So that's the kind of a list of features that are happening now, and will be everywhere, I hope, someday. So what I'm going to do next is to show you a, a future uh, health care clinic, and especially EHR, so what it will look like. So this is a small community outpatient clinic. A patient has an appointment, walks in, and there's a camera on the wall that can do facial detection that recognizes the patient. Once it's detected, so once the patient opens the door, the, med the medical records are already retrieved from, for the person in the front desk. So she can review everything, see what's going on here. So for this specific patient, she is diabetic, has hypertension, and uh, is a cancer survivor and has some gene mutations for Parkinson's. So here's a little bit of a typical, comp typical patient, okay? In this case, the record shows a brief summary of all the major things that she takes some medications over there. And uh, so because this patient may have some new information uh, that is not part of the records, so he's given an iPad to see whether everything new he wanted adding or whatever and confirm. So for this specific case, this patient went to a business trip and he's diabetic and he missed three days of medication. Did not test his glucose. Okay, so every time, every time when he does this, when he opens the, the medication bottle, a sensor records every single dose he takes and every time when he measures the, the glucose level, it sends the data to the, the clinic. Everything recorded. But apparently there are three missing days over there. So he was asked to confirm whether that's the case, what happened. He said, yes, I, w I forgot to bring my medication, whatever. Okay. So that's the, the wireless bottle. And uh, so then when everything's confirmed, <coughs> The patient walks to the exam room. On the way over there, the floor is a scale, <laughs> measure his weight. Okay, and then the camera on the wall is an infrared camera that can measure the temperature from your skin. And when your skin, actually, the blood can change over there. That's an indication of your pulse rate. So it detects your pulse and temperature automatically. And also, another camera will measure your height. So all of these are recorded automatically. You don't have to do anything. Okay? Then when you open the door, the door can measure your blood pressure. So it's just another <laughs> sensor. I do that every single time. That's one of many ways okay, potentially can do. Okay, so once you get into the room, so this is the most comp complex part, and it requires a lot of informatics. Okay, this is speech recognition. So there's no computer over there, no keyboard, don't no type anything. Everything is dictated by speech recognition. So in this case, including the initial exam, problem list, medication, and uh, order, everything is done by speech recognition. And we know that it is not easy task. Many of you are working on natural language processing here. You know, it's not easy to convert free text into structured notes, and uh, code that, and do decision support, advanced things, but it is happening. So potentially down the road, it will be in the real clinics. OK, so for, uh, for this patient, uh, he has hypertension. He takes one type of hypertension medication, which has a side effect for coughing. And he complained about coughing. Then doctor said, oh, yeah, I should switch you so different one may be Cozart. That may change the, the uh, side effects. So all of this basically are based on the statement from the patient. And then the computer system can do the magic over there, recommend a uh, different medication for hypertension over there. And because he was <laughs> <laughs> smart unaware. So because he missed his di diabetic medication, and did not check his glucose for three days. So now <laughs> the doctor said, we have a new device, new treatment, which is, is potentially going to revolutionize 
the care of uh, diabetic patients. So the, the uh, this is real, okay? This uh, <laughs> this is a prototype developed by, developed by the team at UC San Diego. So the the belt on on the underwear is a collection of sensors that can measure your body temperature, pulse, and your glucose level. Okay. So that's then the data will be sent to your smartphone and to the clinic, so all automatically. <coughs> so that's phase one. Phase two, the next step, is to get this reversed, so you can actually deliver medication to the body. So a company is actually working on that. So based on your current glucose level, the time of day, the medication is delivered to your body automatically, dynamically, in real time. And based on your physiological data, <coughs> Uh, especially your, your glucose level, the system can recommend you on what to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, want to take a break, want to exercise, everything. Okay? So it's coming. <laughs> well, that's why we need people here to work on this problem, right? Make sure medical errors do not happen. Okay, then uh, the next one is that before the, the, the patient leaves and uh, uh, the doctor gives him some education material because diabetic patient may have the eye problem, so he showed the patient uh, uh, the eye and recommended a uh, checkup of his eye. Okay, so then before uh, the doctor signs out the screen, send the patient away, he mentioned something even more revolutionary, which is it's coming as part of precision medicine uh, program. So there, you know, you know that uh, there are some kind of, uh, I mean, genetic mutation on genes. Some most of the time mutations are bad, so cause some problems. But sometimes mutations can do something good. So in one study, which was published in Nature like last year, I think, or early this year, they discovered that there's one gene associated with uh, type two diabetes. If we have a mutation for that gene, this patient is not sensitive to glucose level. So basically, that diabetes can go away. So imagine that if we can discover more genes like this, and for hypertension, diabetes, or cancer, or whatever, potentially you can do some uh, gene editing to solve some problems. <coughs> That's futuristic, OK? <laughs> so basically, that's the kind of a version of the what's going to happen or will happen over the next, uh, I don't know, 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And uh, if we consider this is a, a new trend, a new revolution, basically we have no name yet, but I think the closest one is the, the Star Trek. Have you all watched Star Trek? Are you a fan of Star Trek? There is a device called a tricoder. Yep. It's a magic device that can tell you everything about the body, diagnosis, everything. I think uh, that is becoming reality today. So the things we have now can do pretty much everything uh, the tricoder could do in the movie. And it's actually there is the X prize. Well, I think it's still open. If you can create a device maybe this big, last eight hours on a battery, can do about 10, 15 things that they specify, you can win like a 10 million award, something like that. It's big. Okay. So if we want to give a name to this revolution, well, I think we should call that a Star Trek revolution. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's all I have to present. <laughs> now we have some time, a lot of time for questions. So any specific question about our school? I did not cover a lot of data today. And so if you have any question about our academic programs, students, faculty, research, everything. See? So which of you the effect of the new medical school in Austin? Uh, yes. It's affecting us already. I actually we had a meeting this morning and uh, we're complaining. <laughs> so it, not just one, two medical schools. One is the Dell Medical School at UT Austin. Another is the Medical School of UTRGV in Brownsville. Okay. So when you get a new medical school, you do, you need a state funding to support them. Okay. The the new funding does not come from some extra resources. So. We have we have six medical schools already, right? 
we have a fixed amount of money. Now we have eight. We still have the same amount of money. So which means formula funding for all the health science centers will be reduced. And if all your price does not go up quickly, I think we are going to experience some, some, some kind of a downturn for funding from the state. But I guess state funding is only a small portion of what we do for UT Health. For our school, it's a big chunk, but for UT Health, is a small portion. <coughs> so if we do more for the clinical practice, generate more value for the medical school, the clinical partners, I think we will do extremely well. Uh, they have a chair of Department of Population Health, and uh, which is composed of family practice, public health, biostat, biomedical informatics, and population health. We have only one person now, which is someone we all know, Bill Turney from Indiana. And they are going to start an institute of biomedical informatics for research campus-wide across UT Austin. So we already start, we, we already talked and we are going to explore potential operation, I mean collaboration, especially getting our education program to their program if they want to decide to start one. So their initial focus is on research at this time. And biomedical Yes. Bill Turner is a physician, he is a biomedical informatics researcher. He is still the CEO and president of of Rick Institute. It's coming on January 1st. Todd? So what about this new Austin campus that's going to be located in If you are with the University of Houston, you should be worried. <laughs> but for us, it's maybe a, a, a strength for us. So they are going to focus on engineering, energy, and some medical uh, engineering side first. and. Uh, Eventually, for the long term, I think it's going to be UT Houston. And it's not quite now, but eventually it will, will be. Houston is a big city, and it can support more than one major university here. But they are worried about potential funding competition. It's, it's a source of 610. If you go to source main, go out, out of 610, somewhere a big swamp over there. About 300 acres up there, yeah. <laughs> Swam, you want to go there? It's, 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 the size is probably as big as the campus of Rice. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty big. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. <laughs>